Hey everyone, this is a three-part video series on validity, accuracy, and reliability. This is part of the science curriculum under the scope of working scientifically. As a general overview, let's go through the definitions of validity, accuracy, and reliability. Validity refers to how well the experiment measures what it's intended to measure, that is, the aim of the experiment, and generally speaking, it's affected by both accuracy and reliability. Accuracy of results refers to how closely the experimental measurements or data compare to the true and accepted values or data. And reliability of results refers to the consistency of results and how reproducible they are. Now, of course, there are nuances behind each of these terms, so we'll delve into them in much more detail throughout the video. Validity is defined as how well an experiment measures what it's supposed to measure. And when you're assessing the validity of an experiment, you should ask yourself the following questions. Does my experiment actually address or investigate the aim of the experiment? Before you ask this question, obviously it's important for you to be clear on what the aim of the experiment actually is. You should also ask yourself, is my method of the experiment and design suitable for addressing the aim and testing the hypothesis? If so, does my experiment actually test the hypothesis? And again, similar to aim, before you ask yourself this question, you need to be clear on what the hypothesis of the experiment is. If you answer yes to all of these three questions, then most likely your experiment is valid. So how do we ensure and improve the experiment's validity? First of all, we need to have a clear aim and hypothesis. These should be developed and constructed before your experimental method. For an experimental method to be valid, you need to have established controlled variables. These are the variables and factors in the experiment you want to maintain and keep the same throughout your repetition. At the same time, only your independent variable should be changing and choosing the right independent variable is essential because this is the only way to make sure that your experiment is addressing the aim and testing the hypothesis. While the independent variable is being tested, you must make sure that your experiment is measuring the correct dependent variable in order to test the hypothesis. The dependent variable should be the one that's dependent or changing with the independent variable. Now, all of these concepts are quite abstract. So let's use some simple experiments to demonstrate what I mean by independent, dependent, and control variables and how they actually relate to validity. So let's just say I want to measure the effect of different volumes of water on plant growth, specifically the maximum height of the plant after a particular time. When we're designing this experiment, we need to choose our independent variable, dependent variable, and also controlled variable. For an experiment, we can only investigate one independent variable at a time. Of course, an experiment can have multiple independent variables separate into different parts of the experiment. When you're conducting one specific experiment at a time, you should only alter one independent variable. The question that I want to answer for this simple experiment is how does varying amounts of volume of water given to a plant affect its growth rate or how much it grows? Therefore, the independent variable I'm choosing will be the volume of water and the dependent variable that will be suitable for me to measure that reflects the growth rate will be the maximum height of the plant after one month. Once we have selected an appropriate independent and dependent variable, we need to move on and identify and maintain or the other controlled variables. In this experiment, some important control variables that we must identify and keep constant are the type of soil the plant is growing in, because if the type of soil is not kept constant, this may affect the growth rate of the plant, which means it's difficult for us to tell whether it's the volume of water or the type of soil that's affecting the growth rate of the plant. Another control variable is the amount of sunlight the plant is exposed to on a daily basis. As you know, sunlight affects plant growth. So if we want to test the effect of water volume on plant growth, we must make sure that all the plants are exposed to the same amount of sunlight every day. And another potential control variable that should be kept constant is the temperature at which the plant is grown, because very likely that the temperature, whether it's very hot or very cold, can contribute to the growth rate of the plant. Now, as you can see, for such a simple experiment, I've already identified three control variables, and there are more you can identify. These variables are very important for you to spend time to identify before you conduct an experiment because they will affect whether your underlying method will address the aim and test a hypothesis, ultimately affecting the validity of your experiment. So now that we've briefly discussed what validity of the method or experiment refers to, 
I want to discuss the subcategories of validity. When we are assessing validity, this can refer to assessing the validity of the method or the experimental procedure. The validity of the method mainly depends on the variables, including independent, dependent, and control variables. And we want to identify these variables because it will help us answer the question, does the method address the aim and the hypothesis of the experiment? In addition to the variables, you should also ask yourself, does the method include enough repetitions for reliable results? Doing the experiment once is insufficient to say that the method is valid because sometimes the results that are produced may be subject to chance or luck. And in order for a method to produce reliable and valid results, we must repeat the experiment for a sufficient number of times. I'll discuss the role of repetition and reliability in its own section later on. Now, when we are assessing the validity of method of data analysis, this is slightly different to the validity of the method or experimental procedure. Once we have obtained our data or measurements from the experiment, we need to employ suitable methods of analyzing the data in order to arrive at the right results and conclusion. Some of the things that you should consider when assessing whether the method of data analysis is valid includes whether interpolation or extrapolation of data have been used when analyzing the results, whether accepted laws or laws in science or mathematical relationship have been used to analyze the data, and with the final results, whether they are tabulated or presented on graphs. Typically, graphs will offer a more valid analysis of the results compared to tables because graphs will contain gradients, typically of lines of best fit, which will minimize the effect of systematic and random errors. Graphs also provide a visual way for the author and readers to identify any outliers of data compared to tables. Now, I'll go through each of these considerations one by one in using specific examples in chemistry and physics. Most commonly, you'll be asked to assess the validity of results. Again, this is different to the validity of the method and the validity of the analysis of data. Now, these are often confused because when a method and analysis of results are valid, they tend to produce valid results. In order to assess whether your results are valid, we need to assess the accuracy and reliability of the results. So we'll talk about validity of results in more detail when we go through the concepts of accuracy and reliability later on in the video. The dependence of validity on accuracy and reliability will apply for both primary data, which is data that you have produced and obtained from your own experiment, as well as secondary data, which is what you obtain from other people's experiment or your own research online. Once you've understood what validity refers to, whether it's regarding the method, the analysis of data, or the results, it becomes easier for you to identify ways to improve validity. Because you can do this by simply identifying the areas that is lacking validity. If the method is not addressing the aim or the hypothesis of the experiment, then you need to modify the method by controlling the variables by increasing the repetition of the method to increase its validity. By the same rationale, if the analysis of data is inappropriate, for example, you can use a graphical representation rather than tabulated data to analyze the results. And finally, the validity of results can be improved by addressing factors that affect both its accuracy and reliability. I talk about accuracy and reliability of results in more detail later on, so I will come back to this point later. All right, so now we've gone through all the theory behind validity. Let's apply them to two examples. We'll start with a chemistry example. Let's say I want to determine the composition by mass of carbon dioxide in a particular can of soft drink. And I will do this by placing the soft drink above a tripod and a gauze mat, as well as a heat source, for example, a Bunsen burner. The rationale behind this procedure is I'm using heat to evaporate and remove all the carbon dioxide from the soft drink so that the mass of the soft drink can containing a soft drink will be decreasing throughout the experiment. And if I can calculate the difference in mass change, then I'll be able to determine the mass percentage of the carbon dioxide that was formerly in the soft drink. For this experiment, I don't really have independent variable because I'm only investigating one type of soft drink. 
but I do have a dependent variable and that is the mass change I am measuring before and after heating the soft drink can. Some control variables that I need to consider and keep constant which would otherwise affect the mass change of the can will be the temperature of the environment in which I'm conducting the experiment and of course the brand of the soft drink because you would expect the percentage of carbon dioxide to be variable amongst different types and brands of soft drink. Here's the exact steps in the method. We will start by weighing an unopened can of soft drink on an electronic balance and we will record the number. This will contain both the soft drink as well as the carbon dioxide that was in it. We'll then open the can, place the can on a hot plate until it begins to boil. And once we've removed all the carbon dioxide, we'll let the soft drink can cool, followed by reweighing the can to determine its final mass. By subtracting the final mass from the initial mass, we can then calculate the mass loss. And we expect this to be equal to the carbon dioxide that was in the soft drink. Now, I want to use this experiment to highlight validity to explain when an experiment method or procedure is invalid. Remember that the aim or the question of the experiment that I want to address is the mass composition of carbon dioxide in the soft drink. Although using heat and this method, I can effectively remove the carbon dioxide from the soft drink, what I'm also doing is I am removing the water content that's inevitably in the soft drink because all soft drinks will contain some amount of water. In fact, water actually makes up a pretty big part of soft drinks. So the dependent variable mass change not only is due to the loss of carbon dioxide, it's also due to the loss of water. So is measuring the mass loss in this experiment really reflecting and helping me address the aim of the experiment? No, because it is also including the loss of water. So you can see this experimental procedure is not helping me to determine the composition of carbon dioxide. So how do we improve the validity of the experiment? Well, the simple answer is we need to revise the method. We need to modify it so that we can address the reason why the experiment is invalid in the first place. We are removing the water because we are applying heat to the soft drink can. So if we can remove this entire third step here and simply open the can, which lets all the carbon dioxide molecules escape the soft drink without a significant loss of water, then when we are reweighing the can after a certain period of time, the mass change will be reflecting the loss of carbon dioxide, not the water. Okay, let's use a physics example to demonstrate validity. In this experiment, I'm using a simple pendulum system involving a mass attached via a string to a clamp and retort stand. I want to use the oscillation of this pendulum system to determine the value of gravitational acceleration on the surface of Earth. Let's just call that G. The reason why I can use this oscillation system to determine the value of gravity is because the oscillation of the mass is due to the force of gravity. And we have an accepted equation that outlines the relationship between the period of oscillation, which is the time taken for the mass to go back and forth once, and the length of the pendulum string, as well as the value of gravity, which is what we're trying to calculate. In this particular experiment, I will be varying the length of the string, which is the independent variable, and I'll be measuring the period of oscillation, which is the dependent variable. Once we have identified the dependent variable, everything else that could affect the experiment should be kept constant. That is, there will be controlled variables. This includes the mass of the pendulum itself, the location in which you're conducting the oscillation, whether this is in a classroom setting, indoors, or outside the classroom, outdoors as well as the angle of oscillation. At what angle do I start the oscillation from? In this simple pendulum experiment, there are several points affecting validity to consider. First of all, we are relying on an accepted relationship between the period of oscillation and gravity to calculate the value of g. So we are assuming that this equation and relationship is correct. Now, for this particular example, this equation is only true and applicable for oscillations that start with a small angle, which is usually defined as any angle less than 15 degrees. When the angle of oscillation exceeds this value, it actually doesn't obey the equation that I'm using for the experiment. In simpler words, if I want to use this equation to calculate the value of g by observing the oscillation of the pendulum, I need to make sure that the starting angle of oscillation is less than 15 degrees. So that brings me to the point. Whenever you're using an equation, a relationship, or any type of mathematical law in science, 
to help you address the aim of experiment, you must do the research and understand under what conditions does that law or mathematical relationship hold and under what conditions does it not hold. So if the angle of oscillation exceeds 15 degrees, then the underlying experimental method will not be valid. In addition to the small angle rule, this relationship between period and gravity also assumes that the only force exerting on the pendulum throughout its oscillation is the force of gravity. If there's significant amounts of any other forces, for example, air resistance, it will also affect the validity of this particular equation. Therefore, to improve the validity of this experimental procedure, we want to reduce the surface area of the pendulum in order to minimize the effect of air resistance on its motion throughout the oscillation. The third point I want to make in regards to validity is the validity of, of the results, namely the period of oscillation that is measured for each length of the string used in the oscillation. So as you can see, as the length of the string increases, so does the oscillation duration. Very commonly, students fall into the trap of using a single pair of data, that is one length, one meter, and one data point for period, let's say 2.05 seconds, and the equation that we saw before to calculate the force of gravity or the g-value. Now, although this can give you a number for the g-value, you will quickly realize that this is an invalid way of calculating the g-value. Instead, what you should be doing is plotting all of your results obtained from the experiment for every single length of string onto an appropriate graph to construct a line of best fits. In this instance, I am plotting the period squared, which is t squared, against the length. This gives me a linear relationship between t squared and length. Then I will use the gradient of the line of best fits to calculate the g-value. In experiments where you can plot the data and construct a line of best fits, you should always do this over using only one set of results in the table because by using the gradient to calculate g-value here, I have minimized the effect of both systematic and random errors. Let's just say hypothetically, I decided to use this particular value, which would be the 1.5 meter length and the 2.51 period to calculate the G value. As you can see, this data point is slightly deviated from the line of best fit, which means it is affected by some degree of random error. If I had chosen this single data point, my final G value would have been less accurate and less valid because it's being affected by random errors. However, I can overcome this and minimize the effect of error by using the value of the gradient of the straight line as this gradient considers the deviation of all the data points and in a way finds the average in inverted commas of all the data points. Hey everyone, if you found this video helpful, smash that like button and don't forget to subscribe. Want even more? Become a Patreon member for early access to videos, exclusive Discord discussions about questions on chemistry and physics, and live preparation sessions for your exams. Don't forget to head over to our website for topic tests and practice exams to further improve your understanding and learning.